Thank you very much to Honorable Dr. Zakir Naik for the very inspiring, energetic talks. That we are, uh, there are many excellent points that we have learned today. Thank you very much. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have one announcement. Uh, at this executive talk, we have uh, the Inspiracy Mu'allaf. It is one of an NGO that is led by Brother Muhammad Roger James Arnold. And today, the Inspiracy Mu'allaf is opening the, a small booth at the foyer of this hall. And uh, they are raising funds to assist the Mu'allaf as well as the, the Asnaf. And what you can do today, you can donate to the Inspiracy Mu'allaf either by purchasing a special T-shirt or simply donating some money for the Inspiracy Mu'allaf, inshallah. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go to the question and answer session, I'd like to give a few brief guidelines as well as rule so that uh, the session will run very smooth. And to derive more benefits for everyone, uh, the first rule we have, before that I would like to announce, we have four microphones. On the gentleman's side, we have two microphones. I believe uh, the first one, this is the number one, and number two station here. And then for ladies, we have uh, at the center, number three. And then finally, station number four, on the far to the right. Okay? Okay, first one, before you put forward your questions, please state your full name. For example, my name is Muhammad bin Abdullah. And your profession, I'm Muhammad Abdullah, I'm a lawyer. Simply like that, okay? Second one, the question asked should be relevant to the topic that we are discussing today. And I believe for gentlemen, the topic polygamy is going to be a hot one. <laughs> and also for ladies. So please be aware that this is not a debate or lecture time for you. Just speak clearly, directly to the point, go to your question directly. Okay? Third one, only one question should be asked at one time. If you have another question, you have to go back in queue and wait for another chance to ask another question. And finally, it is an honor for Dr. Zakir Knight for non-Muslim. Do we have non-Muslim today in this hall? Do we have non-Muslim among the civil servants in Kelantan? Where the majorities are mostly the Muslim? Do we have one at least non-Muslim here? Yeah, we have, Alhamdulillah. You are given the first preference to ask the questions before the Muslims. So please don't be afraid. We are in a safe place. This is the most peaceful program organized by the Kelantan government, inshallah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin the question and answer question. Question and answers. And I'd like to welcome for the first question, on the left side, on the gentleman's side, on the station number one. Please, gentlemen. Kota Dronaim, come on. One question from the gentleman's side. On the first station, please, mic number one. Please put forward your question. Anybody? Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Honorable Doctor, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, obviously, topic five was the most um, uh, interesting one, but my question is this. Um, I've read an article once, some time ago, that uh, the, the, the author, well, I can't remember who now, but the author argues that all this hatred, all these slanderings, all these uh, labels towards Muslims is not really because of the religion. It's because of this, um, 
economic control that they wish to set upon the world. So it's just that I just want to, to, to see your view on this one. Thank you. So everybody, my name is Mama Iskandar bin Daud from the uh, Teacher Institute of Higher Education, Kota Baru. The brother asked a question that he read an article where the author said that, you know, all these allegations, etc., against Islam is mainly to get control of the Muslim wealth, etc. And the person is right to a great extent. To a great extent, right, what you find, you know, the allegation what we know about the weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq. We know there were no weapons of mass destruction. There weren't an excuse to attack and to take control of the oil wells. So they do fabrication. And unfortunately, most of our Muslims, we sit quiet. If we Muslims unite as one force, no one will be able to bully us. But we Muslims have internal differences. Each one thinks, you know, okay, I am secure, so if my neighboring Muslim country is being attacked, no problem. They don't know the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if your Muslim brother is hurt, it is like one part of your body being hurt. And when something happens to the body, in your body, all the cells go to fight. If you have a cut in the finger, all the cells, they'll go to fight and try and cure that part. <coughs> so the ummah is like a body. And they are trying the level best which we'll discuss tomorrow more in detail. Tomorrow the topic of an Islamophobia. You know, Islamophobia, they want to create that fear so that they can attack, they can have restrictions on Muslims, not because that Islam is killing people, no. It is for other reasons we'll discuss tomorrow. So I do agree that many a time that we have today in the media and people that talk about Islam is mainly to have control of the Muslim wealth, whether it be oil, otherwise. And this is the main reason tomorrow, inshallah, we'll discuss in detail on the topic Islamophobia. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go to... I prefer we have one, one question from our sister, from non-Muslim. Do we have a non-Muslim? You are the first preference to ask the questions. Please. Put forward your question. Non-Muslim, any non-Muslim would like to put up question, please. No, otherwise we go for the second session. Yes, please state your name and your profession and put forward your question, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Muhammad Adi bin Muhammad Sa'ad. I'm an officer from the Office of Chief Minister of Kelantan. I would like to ask Doctor a question. Okay, recently. Indian government has deleted Article 370 from its constitution due to the misconceptions upon our uh, uh, Kashmir, towards the uh, state of Kashmir. Resulting, Kashmir has no more autonomy power to go regulate its affairs. Some say that it will become the next Palestine. I hope that uh, it, should be, uh, it should not be happened. So, what is your comments about this uh, particular issue? And then how, as we, as state government and people of Malaysia and a brother in Islam towards Kashmir people to react on this particular issue? Thank you very much, Doctor. As far as the dishes, the decision taken by Indian government recently, by the BJP government, especially Narendra Modi, is to re repeal or cancel constitutional. It's unconstitutional. Because you know that Kashmir was independent land. When the partition took place between India and Pakistan, Kashmir became a part with having clauses. It's independent and no one can buy any property there. No one can become a citizen. All these clauses were there, which slowly, slowly, many of the clauses were not followed. Now the main clause of 370, they want to repeal it and they want to make it into a union territory which is unconstitutional, but there is a law in the government that if you have two-third majority in the upper house and the lower house, if you have majority in the Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha, you can change the constitution. That's the reason they are changing now, which have many repercussions, 
what should be done? I believe that the Muslims all over the world should object to it and put as much as pressure as possible to undo this. And as you said rightly, that they are doing something what similar happened in what happened in Palestine. And Palestine, we know it belonged to the Muslims, to the Palestinians. During the war, they gave the Jews a cent just shelter. They gave them shelter and they took away the full house. And now when the Palestinians are crying that give back a house, you're calling Palestinians a terrorist. Same thing is happening in Kashmir. And you know, they're trying to do a survey which model works. And if they think that the Palestinian model worked, but at least for the Palestinian cause, Alhamdulillah, to a great extent, the Muslims were united. Not that we could protect it completely, but Alhamdulillah, to a great extent, we were united. But in other issues, we are not. I don't know how far will the Muslim countries react to this. But logically speaking, Islamically speaking, all the Muslim countries should unite and try and protect the rights of the Kashmiris. All, should, all the Muslim countries should unite. Will they or not? Allah wala. Seeing the situation of the Muslim that we are today, we are going far and far away from the Quran and the Sunnah. We are more bothered about maintaining our seat, our chair, our position, our power, rather than following Allah and His Rasul. The day we follow Allah and His Rasul, we secure our seat in Jannah. And the topic yesterday was Quran, the part to happiness. And I said that securing a seat in Jannah is more, is more important than securing a seat in this world. This seat that you have in the world is temporary. You are like a traveler, the Prophet said. Unfortunately, the state of the Muslim Ummah is, is very pathetic. Very pathetic. We aren't raising the voice. And we came to know about the Uyghur Muslims. Today, the Muslims that are harassed the most in the world, according to me, it's not the Palestinian, it is the Chinese Uyghur Muslims. That Muslims in the Xinjiang area. And according to the reports of various human organizations, and various organizations for human rights, they say one to two million Muslim, Uyghur Muslim in China, they have been imprisoned in concentration camps, <clears throat> which they call as education camps. And they started in 2015. Previously, the harassment was less. It came in the light to the public, to some of the human rights organizations in 2017, was known to the world in starting 2000. 17, 2016, they came to know, and now it is more common, so common that many of the human rights organizations objected, and recently, last month, in July, there were 22 countries who objected to the violation of human rights in China. And do you know, out of the 22 countries, not a single country was a Muslim-majority country. Not a single. 22, most of them European countries, 100% non-Muslim countries, they laid an objection in the UN, United Nations, against China for violation of human rights. Shocking, not a single Muslim country. Some give the example, we don't know. <laughs> you don't know. That news was not as bad as the news I got after a few days. The news we get after a few days that 37 countries, 37 countries, and wrote a letter to UN that China is not violating the human rights. They are doing counter-terrorism. They are right. 37 countries. And the shocking part of it is, little less, little less than 50% of these countries, they were Muslim-majority countries. About 15 to 16 Muslim countries out of 37 countries, majority country, they wrote a letter to UN. What China is doing is right. They are torturing the Muslims. It's not torture. It's good education. Re-education camp. 
I can understand that some, most of the Muslims, 100% all, not most, all the Muslim country was scared because China is a superpower, can understand. So China is a superpower, so if we speak, there may be economic embargo, etc., etc. A beloved prophet said, if you see something wrong, number one, if you can stop it with your hand, stop it with your hand. Number two, if you cannot stop with the hand, at least stop with the tongue. If you cannot stop with the tongue, at least curse in your heart. And if you curse in your heart, you will be the lowest level of mu'min believer. Can say maybe all these Muslim countries, you know, they are scared and all. So maybe they did not object. Maybe Allah will forgive them. Allah Allah. Maybe Allah Allah. But later on, about 16 Muslim countries agreeing with the haram activity, Allah will never forgive them. Good news is, Alhamdulillah, Malaysia is not one of those countries who said that China is right. We can understand that China is a powerful country. Maybe you could not object. Allah will forgive. Alhamdulillah, Malaysia did not sign the letter that what China is doing is right. So they are quiet. Believe me, if you fear Allah, you will not fear anyone else. The problem is the Muslims fear other people more than Allah. <clears throat> if you know that our main destination is Akhirah, our main destination is that we have to go to Jannah. The problem is we are not good businessmen. I would like to give you the example of Abu Darda. May Allah be pleased with him. That once, when a new Muslim was making a house boundary for himself, the neighbor, the Jewish house, in his house was a dead palm tree coming into the house of that new Muslim. So he could not build the wall. And the Jewish said, you dare touch my tree. And there was a big problem, so he came to the Prophet. That, you know, this neighbor's Jewish tree is coming in the way. I cannot build the boundary. So the Prophet calls the Jew and tells him that if you let this date palm grow, give it to him. I will give you one tree in Jannah. The Jew says, are you crazy? <laughs> I don't want it. I'm happy with my date palm here. So Abu Darda, may Allah be pleased with him, he owned one of the best gardens of date palm in Medina. He goes to the prophet and asks him that if I can get the date palm tree for that Muslim, will I get a date palm tree in Jannah? The prophet says, yes, of course. So Abu Darda goes to the Jew and tells me that do you know who you am? Who am I? He says, no, I don't know who you are. I'm Abu Darda. Ah, Abu Darda that owns one of the best date palm tree in Medina. Yeah, what can I do for you? He gives him an offer. That if you give me this one date palm tree, I will give you my full garden, 100%. The Jewish said, are you crazy? I said, no. Wallah, I will give it to you. So he said, okay. So he said, fine. He gets that tree and gives it to that new Muslim. And he goes and tells his wife that today I have clicked the deal. I said, what have you done? He says that I have exchanged our full garden of date palm for one tree in Jannah. And the reply of the wife was, ah, what a deal. Today people say, you're crazy. You should have given half the garden. Surely in half the garden also that Jew would have given the tree. Yes or no? Yes or no? Even if he had given quarter garden, he would have given that one tree. But the wife replies of Abu Darda, Ah, what a deal you have clicked. Today's wife will say, Beowulf, fool, idiot. Okay, you want a tree in Jannah? Give quarter garden. Why full garden? Because they knew the value of Jannah. 
Imagine they're giving up all the wealth and the, and the Sira tells us of the Sahaba that till the end of his life he lived in poverty, not that he had wealth. He gave his full wealth away for one tree in Jannah. This is the Iman that the Sahabas had. His full wealth only for one tree in Jannah, which you could have even given quarter and you would have got it. And the wife agrees, what a deal. So today, unfortunately, we are so afraid. We are so possessive of our wealth, so possessive of our things. Imagine when our Muslim brothers are dying, they are being killed, they are being tortured. In China, at least in Palestine, they can pray openly. In Palestine, they can fight openly, they can do jihad openly. They can fast. In China, these Shingi and Muslim, most of them aren't allowed to pray. They aren't allowed to fast. They are forced to drink alcohol in Ramadan. If you object, they put you in concentration camp called as re-education camps. What are we doing? There's so much of evidence available. Some countries say we Muslim countries say we don't have evidence. So what we realize that we Muslims, we haven't understood the real value, which is gold. If we follow the Quran and the seed of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we'll be in a much better position. The happiness that we'll get in our life, which we discussed yesterday, is tremendous. The problem is we don't read the Quran, we don't understand the Quran, we don't read the Hadith, we don't implement on it. Happiness doesn't come by wealth. Happiness doesn't come by position. Happiness doesn't come by power. Happiness doesn't come by gold. It comes with the satisfaction in your heart and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in a very pathetic situation and history is repeating itself. Now they are doing it in India. When they could do it in Palestine, what are the Muslims doing? They are in China, what are the Muslims doing? So what do we expect the Muslims to do when they are doing in India? I can talk. So I am talking. I knew that I talked in India and high chances I will be thrown out. Okay. At least I stayed for 25 years. I thought it would be much more earlier. Alhamdulillah. We are doing it for our Jannah Akhirah. Why aren't the Muslims united on this issue? I'm talking about the Islamic issue. I'm not a politician. I don't do involved in the politics. But we Muslims should unite. And Alhamdulillah, one of the reasons that according to me, amongst the Muslim countries in the world, one of the best countries available in the world is Malaysia. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Malaysia continue being the best. We always saw Malaysia fighting for the Palestinian rights, fighting for the Rohingya rights. We hope it continues. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the Malaysian the guts and the power. It's a small country, no problem. But if you have the power of Allah, it becomes the most powerful country. But if you want Allah on your side, then you'll become the powerful country. If you don't want Allah on your side, you won't become powerful. So to make it the most powerful country, who do you require? Allah on your side. So if you follow the commandment of Allah and follow the commandment of beloved prophet in the hadith, you'll become the most powerful country. But if you have faith in Allah, I chose to live in Malaysia because amongst the various, I had offers from about 15 countries. I felt Malaysia amongst, you could say, best of the worst or best available, whatever you want to say, among the Muslim countries. We have 56 majority Muslim countries. I chose that it is good, it's away from the war zone. No, it's not like you see Gulf countries, Yemen, Syria, war zone. Number two, it doesn't have so much of pressure from the Western countries like the other Muslim countries. Number three, it's a country which has the most powerful Muslim passport. 180 countries you can travel without visa. 
I don't know if all of you, some may be knowing, all may not be keeping track of it. You go to the Henley passport, 180 countries without visa. It's an advanced country. It's a country where the federal religion is Islam. You have about two-thirds Muslims living. It's good. So you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may the Muslims of Malaysia be united. If you are united, you are a stronger force. If you are divided, you'll become weak. So my only advice or suggestion to Muslims all over the world, including Muslims of Malaysia, for Allah's sake, let your differences aside, and for the cause of Islam, we should unite. And this has been my message always for all the Muslims. If we are united, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, wa tafarku. Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. So if we unite, the best criteria where we can unite is on the basis of Quran. Whatever the Quran says, at least that is the common factor of Muslims throughout the world. Whether you live in West, East, Arab country, non-Arab country, this is the uniting factor. And inshallah, if we, if we have this uniting factor, there will not be situation like Palestine or China or India 370, what happened in Afghanistan, what happened in Iraq. And I was happy in Iraq, I was happy that mashallah, there was, like we have the International Court of Law in Hague, a similar one was started in Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur, war crimes, KLWC. And in, I think in the year 2011, if I'm not mistaken, it was started by Sun Dr. Mahathir. And they had the guts and, alhamdulillah, the courage that they had a tribunal of five judges, they had lawyers from different parts of the world, and they put to trial the previous president of USA, George Bush, and the previous president of UK, Tony Blair. And Alhamdulillah, I really admired the guts. No Muslim country had the guts, but Malaysia had the guts. In the war crime tribunal, they laid and they said the people responsible for fabricating evidence is the former president of USA, George Bush and Tony Blair. If they set foot in Malaysia, we will arrest them. MashaAllah. Malaysia, small country, had the guts to challenge the superpower with the help of Allah. And they did it. Later on, five years later, 2016, in UK, the Chircot report, they say that America and UK fabricated evidence to show that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction to attack Iraq. So what does Tony Blair come and say? It is, I'm very sorry, I regret, the most act I regret ever in my life is this act. That's it. Sorry. You know, more than a million people died, thousands of people in the war, and because of the sanction, millions of children died, and adults died because of sanction. Only sorry. At least Malaysia, they had the KLWC, Kuala Lumpur war crime, alhamdulillah. I wish such more tribunals are set up here. And if they can object same way with China, if they can object same thing with India and all the, we cannot, I'm not telling you do violently. Okay, at least have such, you have the KLWC. Okay, there you can do it. I mean, my suggestion. At least you can say one Muslim country in the world, the non-Muslim 22 countries, maybe some may be having benefit or some agenda, whatever it is. At least they stood for the truth. Similarly, what's happening in India? In India, we Muslim the minority, according to government, 14.5%. Muslims say we are about 20-25%, but if we agree with 14.5% also, the 
Here are the non-Muslims. The Hindus are 6.3%, 6.4%. The Hindus in Malaysia get more than 100 times more rights than the Muslims in India. Good. Alhamdulillah. I'm not saying take away their rights. Good. This is what Muslims should do. They are half the percentage, numbers wise very less, half the percentage of India where Muslims are. <clears throat> Yet the rights they get here is 100 times more than what India gives rights to minority. So much so that they support the Prime Minister of India but not Prime Minister of Malaysia. MashaAllah. The Prime Minister of India wants me. The Prime Minister of Malaysia does not want injustice to be done to me. The Hindu Malaysians are most of them supporting Prime Minister of India. There is no evidence about me in the Malaysian police. Interpol says no evidence. They are believing more in India. They are more Indian than the Malaysian themselves. And yet they are enjoying, Alhamdulillah. At least the Muslims should get their rights. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give more hikmah, more courage to Malaysia to voice out for the rights of the Muslims throughout the world. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, ladies. This is 30 minutes past 11, and we still have lots of time to go for the Q&A sessions. And I'd like to stimulate the audience to more eagerness to show your support to Zakir to give out more questions, insyaAllah. So, tuan-tuan dan puan-puan, saya jemput semua ya, supaya bersemangat untuk mengambil bahagian dalam mengemukakan persoalan kerana jarang-jarang kita dapat bersama dengan seorang tokoh dunia untuk sesi soal jawab. Jadi, jangan teragak-agak untuk bertanya kerana masa yang diberikan, kita ada lebih kurang satu jam lagi untuk ditamatkan acara. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, go to the next station we have from the ladies' side. From the third station, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yeah, please put up your name first and your profession and go to the point. Thank Assalamualaikum you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang, um, Mr. Zaki Naim. My name is uh, Dr. Selasawati Ghazali. I'm a medical uh, doctor. So my, question, my concern is uh, regarding the misconceptions. It is not only for the non-Muslim, but basically it's more for the Muslim themselves. Basically, many of Muslim were genetically born Muslim. I think the lack of practice obviously there. So that's why a lot of issues being discussed because we ourselves don't understand. And this is again we're coming back to the united issues and unable to be togetherness in, in facing issues. They're, that's divided. And I, I think this is not only in Malaysia but also in the rest of the world. Until we come up with uh, common things in common, then we can sit together, discuss together, and we can make the difference. And we know that differences um, all over, we found differences that this is not good for us. This is really not helping us to fight against many, many things. So if you can tell us, you know, and, and especially with the issues where the non-Muslim or other peoples doing something which is uh, slandering on the <coughs> prophets themselves and we Muslims just keep quiet about it and we just like helpless not able to defend Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and left alone the, the, the religious itself I, I need sir. your comment on that and also <coughs> what what do you think which strength could we have you know because many of us uh, feel very sad about it but we are just hand tied thank you this has asked a very good question and a very important question that Muslims are born, they're born in Muslim families, they may not know some teachings of Islam, there are differences, it's not in Malaysia, it is all over the world and we find that non-Muslims are taking advantage, how can we unite? What is the strategy, what is the force that can unite the Muslims? Sister, the only force, the only thing that can unite the Muslims all over the world, whether you come from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Saudi Arabia, whether from America, from UK, or India. It is a glorious Quran. 
And I said this in my earlier answer also. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse number 103, Wa atasimu bihablillahi jamia wa la Hold to the rope of Allah strongly. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith. Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. We may have different cultures, no problem. We may have different languages, no problem. You may have different parties, no problem. But when it comes to Islam, all the Muslims should unite under one banner of Islam and call ourselves Muslims and follow Allah and His Rasul. Whenever any issue comes, the problem is that we have not made Quran as our source of guidance. And I know that Quran is the most widely read book in the world. But unfortunately, it is also the most widely read book without understanding. The Quran was not only sent for reciting. Yes, you'll get your sawab, you should recite in Arabic, good. But besides that, you should understand what it says. To understand, if you know Arabic, it's the best. If you don't know Arabic, read it in the language you understand the best. If you know Malay, read it in Malay. If you know English, read it in English. If you know Urdu, read it in Urdu. Read it in the language you understand the best and implement on it. If you read the Quran, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 28, that in the remembrance of Allah, do the hearts find contentment. Verily, the hearts find contentment in the remembrance of Allah. So if you read the Quran and understand it, you will come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will come closer to the Muslims all over the world. The uniting factor is the glorious Quran. Your courage will come from the Quran and from the Sahih Hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Unfortunately, we depend more on other sources. Yes, you know, here I find many people, mashallah, PhD, and all over the Muslim world. Good. Alhamdulillah. There's no harm in education. Educate yourself. The first guidance given by Allah. But see to it that there is something, education which is fard and one which is fard kafaya. Fard for every Muslim is basic education of Islam. Fard. You may not be a mufassir, you may not be a muhaddis. That is fard kafaya. To be a doctor is not a fard. That's fard kafaya. To be an engineer is not a fard. If some of them among you are, that is sufficient. For the Ayn is the basic knowledge of Islam. It is the message of the Quran. We find today, sister, you gave a generic question, and my reply is generic also, that various problems that you have, you show me what, what solution is not there in the Quran for the problem that we are facing today. Every problem that is there in the world today, Quran has a solution. And Allah guides not the Fasik people. Allah is telling in this verse of the Quran of Surah Tawbah, the only surah which begins without Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah is giving a warning to the Muslims that if you love your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives and husbands, your relatives, the wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live, if you love all these things more than Allah, more than His Rasul, then wait until Allah destroys you. And that's what's happening to us. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Muhammad chapter number 47 verse number 38 Allah says yes tabdil common gairukum summa laikunam salakum if you do not do your job if you turn away from Allah Allah will substitute in a place another people summa laikunam salakum and they will not be like you you know Allah had chosen first the Jews as the chosen people majority of the prophets almost all except a few mentioned in the Quran they were Jewish prophets they thought they were superior. Allah told them to deliver the message. They didn't deliver. So Allah says, yes, common gairukum, summa laikunam salakum. If you do not do a job, Allah will substitute your place. And other people, they will not be like you. And what does Allah do? The Jews looked down upon the Arabs at the most ignorant people. It was called as Yomil Jahiliya. The Arabs used to do tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Most jahil people. What does Allah do? Allah picks up the people who you look down upon and make them sit on the head. After reading the Quran, the Muslim became the torchbearer of the world. Muslims were on top of the world. Today, we are in number, but we are at the bottom of the world. Why? That time we were close to Quran and Sunnah. 
Quran made us go on top of the world. Today, we are far away from Quran and Sunnah. So if you do not do your job, Allah will substitute you. And they will not be like you. So Allah doesn't require us the rubbish that we are. Do you think Allah requires me to make Islam prevail? I will be the biggest fool in the world if I start thinking I must die and Islam is spreading because of me. Biggest fool. Allah is giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. Allah can do it within a fraction of a second. Does it require us? Do you think Allah cannot make the problem solve in Palestine or Kashmir or China? Allah is testing us Muslims. For Allah to do, kun fa kun. Very easy. But Allah is testing us. We are undergoing the test. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mul, chapter number 6, and verse number 2, Allah di khalaq al mawta wal hayata. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. For Allah to solve this, and Allah has promised that. Allah says clearly in the Quran, in no less than three different places. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34. Allah says in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 16, verse number 9. Allah says, Huwa al-lazhi arsal rasul wa bilu da wa din al-haq li uzhira wa al-dine kulli wa lo qariya al-mushikun. Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all their religion, over all their deism, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, secularism, atheism, socialism. Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulli! Master them all. And Allah says, However much the mushrik don't like it. And one place Allah says, وَقَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَيْدَ And enough is Allah is the witness. Allah does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Do you think Allah requires you and me? No. He is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. Do dawa. At least speak. <coughs> and it is mentioned in the Sahih Hadith that finally Islam will prevail. It's the promise of Allah in the Quran. And we will rule the world for seven years. We don't know whether we'll live till that time. These are the Akhir Zama, the signs of the last hour. That's a big topic by itself. Allah is testing us in this position. What should we do as individuals? I am not the king of a country. I'm not the prime minister or the president. What can I do? I, as a Muslim, actually follow the Quran. Allah will not question you that why did you do this or do that. Allah will question you what you are, how did you do or not. The least we can do is pray for our Muslims in China, for our Muslims in Palestine, for the Muslims in India. The least you can do is you can speak. What Allah has given you capacity, do that at least. What Allah has not given you capacity, Allah will not question you. Allah will question those people who Allah has given capacity. If I have the, if Allah has given me the technique of speaking, Alhamdulillah, and if I don't speak, Allah will take away my speech. So we sister, number one, should see to it that we at least are on the straight path. Because many a times Muslim talk, but when they get in that position, they do the same thing what the others are doing. Because now we are not in position, you say we should do this, we should do that. When you get to the position, you are worse than the person who was there before you. This is what's happening throughout the world. To come to power, you will say you will follow Allah, you will follow Quran. When you come to power, you are the first person to go away from Allah and his Rasul. Why? So Muslims should unite. Whatever you can do, sister, whether on the social media, whether on the WhatsApp, whether on the Facebook, whether on the Twitter, uh, Twitter, whether on the Instagram, whatever way, you see to it that you pray for these people, Allah is sufficient for them, and what action you do, what you can contribute with your time, with your money, with your energy, with your ability, and the Muslim, he is not feeding his neighbor and talking about other things. Why aren't they doing in that part of the world? And if Allah has given you money, at least help your neighbor, that you can do. That you're not doing and you're talking about other things. Good. So see to it that you don't fall in the same position. 
I, as a Muslim, don't fall in the same position where Allah has given me authority. I'm not helping my other Muslim brothers. I'm not helping my non-Muslim neighbors. The Prophet said, a Muslim is not a true Muslim. A, a person who eats his tummy full and his neighbors are hungry. And the Prophet said, 40 houses next to you is your neighbor. So we know today there is a lot of test for the Muslims. Unfortunately, most of us are not close to Quran Sunnah. I advise all the Muslim brothers and sisters, at least you see that you are following your immediate responsibility, number one, of Salah, of Zakat, of Hajj, of Ramadan, immediate responsibility. Most important. It will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Read the Quran with translation, implement it. Then, whatever you can do, keep on doing more and more. And Allah, inshallah, the more what Allah has given you, you do, then Allah will give you more. I was a stammerer. I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. I could never have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Inspired by Sheikh Ahmed, I started speaking. MashaAllah, now addressing 100,000, 1 million people. Alhamdulillah. I am in I am no, this is a miracle. People know me that I used to stammer in my childhood. So it's all from Allah. It's nothing about my own. It is Allah who has given me. Otherwise, we are zero. So my advice to the Muslim Ummah is that let the Muslim unite on the basis of Quran and Sunnah. As much as you can do, keep on doing and continue striving. Whether you get results or not, a secondary, stick to the Quran and Sunnah. Inshallah, you'll enter Jannah. Hope that answers the question, sir. Alhamdulillah, what an amazing explanation from Dr. Zakir. Alhamdulillah, Allah has granted him with his superior knowledge about Islam. Thank you very much, Doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go to one more question on the station number four. Dan untuk pengetahuan anda, ya, saya dapat maklumat ramai yang nak bertanya, tapi malu nak tanya dalam English. So, kita boleh gunakan Bahasa Malaysia. So, you can ask in Bahasa Melayu, you can ask in Mandarin, you can ask in Thailand, in whatever language, inshallah, we have the best translators here to project your question to the Zakir. So, may I have another question from session number four? Please, ladies. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Nurul Fauzi Hanis Binti Jailani and I'm a student from uh, UITM. Nervous. <laughs> okay, so um, my question is, if a person sometimes doesn't believe the existence, the existence of God in her entire life, but somehow when her last breath, she receives shahada, does she go to heaven? Is it as simple as that? I mean, thank you. The sister has a question that if someone doesn't believe in the existence of God for the full life, but in the last breath says the Shada, will she go to Jannah, will he go to Jannah? Sister, it depends what do you mean by last breath. Because last breath means if the Malkal moth has come and if you're dying, if you have seen death coming towards you and then you say the Shada, it's not accepted. And Firon in the Quran it says he was a Taqut, he used to call himself God. When he was drowning, he said this believe in Allah. Too late. Do you think he'll go to heaven? No. So last moment means maybe a few days before dying, no problem. If the death approaches you and you can see death coming and then you face a shahada, it's too late. But maybe a few days before dying or maybe the death hasn't approached and you say the shahada and you may die the next minute, no problem. As long as the death hasn't approached you, then if you say the shahada and it will take you to Jannah because the moment a non-Muslim agrees that he bears witness there's no God but Allah, and he believes that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, all his previous sins are forgiven. And there's a hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's a hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, that the Prophet said that there is a person who does full life good deeds, deeds of Jannah, until he's one arm's length to Jannah. And at the last moment, he does deeds of Jahannam and he goes to Jahannam. And the Prophet continues. There's a person who does full life deeds of Jahannam 
until he is one arm's length away from Jahannam, hell. And he does good deed, deeds of Jannah, and he goes to Jannah. So, therefore, we pray that may Allah make us die on Iman. That's more important. Dying on Iman is more important. Best in living and dying on Iman. Inna salati wa nusuki wa maya wa mati of the Quranic verse of Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 162, that this life, a prayer, a sacrifice, our life and death is for Allah. That is the best. But between the two, earlier part or latter part, the latter part is more important. And anyone who accepts the Shahada, the Prophet said, all his previous sins are forgiven. The good deeds are kept, all his sins are forgiven, as though he's newborn. So if someone who doesn't believe in Allah the full life, before dying, if he accepts Islam, if she accepts Islam, inshallah they'll go to Jannah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Any non-Muslims who would like to put forward a question for the Tazakir? You are the first preference. You can jump up the queue and go to the microphone to ask any questions. Any non-Muslim here? Okay, I go. We go to another station. We come again to the first station on my left, on the gentleman station. I would like to welcome gentlemen. Please forward to the microphone for your question, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. Zak Zakir Naik and salam sejahtera to the all audience. Uh, before I, actually I, my name is Zainuddin bin Haji Sulaiman, working as a bookkeeper in the Accountant General Department of Malaysia. Uh, Actually, during my further studies abroad in first Australia, uh, at that time I felt sick, so I was got treatment inside the hospital there. Uh, while I was uh, in the hospital, come to my mind, I want to uh, make, make my own. I mean, I, I want to 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 know what is inside the Australian people mind or their heart regarding the life of the death. Okay, I write on the piece of paper uh, beginning, beginning with the after the number one it's not two but one point zero 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 and never reach to Number two, that's only serve as an introduction. And now this is the, the, the real question. Where we are going after this? A, heaven, B, paradise, C, hell. Brother, I, sorry, brother, I mean, I cannot understand some of your words. Most oh. of it I can. What you said before, 1.000, that I didn't understand. You said life after death. So can you repeat the part which you said before 1.000? Uh, I mean, uh, just, uh, I don't know how to explain. Just to give him, to show that there is something in the world that we could not understand. That's why I said, for example. There are many things in the world we don't understand. What's the question? Can you come to the question directly? Okay, you are giving okay. background, everything. Question, brother, okay. as the chairman said. Actually, question should be one or two sentences. If it's more yes. than two sentences, it becomes a lecture. I am giving lecture here. Fine? <laughs> question to the point. Your name and question. Yes. Background, okay, I don't sorry. want. Only sorry, question. Sorry. Yes, brother. Sorry, sorry. And then he took pen from me. And he's not straight away pick up the answer for a few minutes, and then he wrote the answer himself. He put the, the another choice. Brother, can you really? start, please, can you start the question afresh in short two sentences? Okay. From start, only question, no background. I asked him. Who, uh, who him? The, the staff of the start hospital. Start the question from again, brother, from now. There's no him, only me and you are there. 
uh, where we are going after this. I ask him, A, heaven, B, paradise, C, hell. And then he doesn't agree with all the three. He put himself, D, others. That's only the question for you to maybe can describe why he cannot, cannot, cannot agree with one of three of my choice. He gave another, which means others. Jesus. Brother, you asked a question to someone. <laughs> he gave a wrong answer. You want me to give, ask me why he gave a wrong answer. You know him, I don't know him. Who is the him, I don't know. You are telling me question asked A, B, C, D. He chose D. Why he chose D? What do I know? I am not, I don't know, I will make it. So your question is not at all making any sense. So can we have the next question? That is what, when they tell like you that the Australia, you may have been to Australia many times. Uh, Memang saya tanya pun dia dalam bahasa Inggeris sebab dia orang Australia. Saya, saya sedang di, I was admitted in the hospital. So I take chance to make my own survey uh, to the Australian people. How their assumption regarding life after death. That's actually the beginning, the introduction. You want to know what the assumption of the Australian life after death? Yes. That's why I, uh, I most of you. the people in Australia don't believe in life after death. Yeah. If you want to know the reply of life uh, after death, that uh. is the 17th answer of my question. <laughs> in my 20 most common question, the 17th uh -huh. question is, can you prove life after death? So if you go on the net, there's my book available on the most common questions. You pick up the 17th answer is wrong. Now we have shortage of time. The 17th reply, how to prove life after death is given in that book. It's yeah. also available on the video. <laughs> and inshallah, that will satisfy you. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, brother. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so please be aware that you have to speak clearly. Please be briefly and to the point. And no lectures and no debates on this session. Just a quick, short question to Dr. Zaki. So I go to the next station. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh, Dr. Zakir. My name is Muhammad Erik Zahan, Berudisham. I am a internship student from University Technology Mara, UITM Puncak Perdana, and I am from IT department, uh, SUK. Okay, my question is, uh, Doctor, um, how do you face? the problem, the matter that you uh, face to you nowadays and how you manage the situation and also what you feel about it. Can you give an answer so you, we, can, uh, we, can, we all can take that as, as our inspiration? Thank you, Dr. Brother, the question that what is my situation now and how am I facing the difficulties? And we want the reply so that it can give inspiration to us. Alhamdulillah, I would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one for all the blessings that Niyama he has given us. Mashallah, especially me. I wouldn't like to exchange my position with any other human being living today. You know, there are about 7.8 billion people living in the world. What Niyama Allah has given me I would not like to exchange my position with any other person that I know of. Past, there are many good people present. Whether they are prime ministers, presidents, king, whatever it is, what Niyama Allah has given me is Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah. And we are undergoing a test. You may have heard in the news that because of my dawah activities in India, in 2016, they banned the organization. I was traveling abroad, I did not go back. Because we know that they lay allegations against the Muslims and by the time we prove ourselves in the court of law, we may get justice after 20 years. So I didn't want to be a dead hero. You know, we follow the guidance given by my beloved Prophet Muhammad When the life is in danger, problem, what do you do? You do hijrat. So we did hijrat. And amongst the country, there are 
about maybe 15 countries that told me you come and live here. Amongst them, I thought that Malaysia was the best, alhamdulillah. Therefore, I chose to be here, and I'm happy to be in Malaysia. My life in Malaysia is multiple times better than my life in India. There are several niyama. I had a lot of fans in India, even a lot of enemies. Here also, mashallah, I've got more fans, I've got few enemies here also, mashallah. You know, as Allah says in the Quran, that for every prophet have we kept an enemy. You know, so the da'is are the followers of the prophet, you know, trying to spread the message. So if you're a true da'i, you're bound to have enemies. There's part and parcel. It adds spice to our life. So we shifted from India, you know, by Allah's grace, we had one of the largest private Muslim da'wah organization in the world in terms of budget, in terms of people. We had 500 people working full time for us. Now, only three, four. But I'm happy here with three, four employees. There we had 500 employees, mashallah. Largest da'wah organization, more than 10,000 volunteers. Now, mashallah. Yet the work is continuing. They are trying a level best to stop activities. One of our major activities is Peace TV. We have Peace TV in English, which was launched 13 and a half years back, having a viewership of more than 100 million, mashallah. Largest watch religious channel in the world, more than even the Christian channel. We launched the second channel, Peace TV Urdu, in 2009, which is about 10 years back, having a viewership of 80 million. We launched Peace TV Bangla in 2011, about eight years back having a viewership of 50 million, and 2015, December, about three and a half years back, we launched Peace TV Chinese and Mandarin. And now, mashallah, the live telecast is going to all the four channels, more than 200 million viewers, mashallah. So our work is continuing. The more we do dawah, the more they're trying to pressurize us. I gave you the example of UK. Before 2010, I could travel anywhere in the world. But when they found the popularity, they found the peace TV, they found people accepting Islam. Every day, alhamdulillah, hundreds of people, Allah is giving hidayah due to peace TV. Every day. We are sitting in Malaysia, but the channel is continuing. The enemies of Islam are trying their best to, to close it. Allah does not require peace TV to spread Islam. We are thankful to Allah that is utilizing us. Allah does require us. So we are striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Life here is much better. They have taken all the property, but property will not take you to Jannah. It's good, you know, property can go in loss in business. Someone can rob, an earthquake can come, your house can get destroyed. If the kafir, the enemies of Islam have taken a property of Adai, what better thing that I can thank Allah it's been used for? We want a house in Jannah, not house in the world. So when Abu Darda could give all his wealth, so we get inspiration from the Sahaba, that if this can get us Jannah, it's a very good deal. It's a very good deal. And I gave you the reasons why I chose Malaysia. We are continuing activity, alhamdulillah. And we are doing with bigger. See, the thing is, Allah doesn't see the results. Allah sees your striving. Because the result that we got, believe me, impossible. Bombay is one of the most difficult places in the world to do dawah. And when there we could have the largest conference in the world, a million people for five years, impossible. I cannot say I'm intelligent, I'm smart, no. So with whatever effort we did, the result we got is a million times than what we deserve. <coughs> now we are striving, we have to strive harder. Result comes or not, Allah gives you for your striving, not for your results. Results are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are continuing our dawah, there are people who are for us, people who are against us, most of the Muslims for us, there are some secular Muslims, there are some Munafik Muslims who are against us. All this is part and parcel of life. If you don't have this spice, we have to keep on striving, we have to keep on struggling, and we have to continue whatever we can give to the community, whatever we can do for the spread of Islam, we are continuing. If we become silent and stop, then what's the use? So if Allah has given some ability to you, not that I wasn't aware. I thought I would have been kicked out many years back. Well, alhamdulillah, 25 years we did dawah in India. Mashallah. 25 years. And Allah gave hidayah to so many people. Alhamdulillah. Your life in Malaysia, as I told you, is much better. More ibadah, more time to contemplate, 
with less workers, you have to do more jihad. Jihad means striving and struggling, not, not war. And we are doing that. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have other strategies of how to expand our activities, how to grow. Now there is social media, etc. And what we can contribute, we keep on meeting, you know, leaders of many countries in the world. Just a couple of months back, I met a prime minister of a country outside Malaysia. I gave a, as I told you, a talk to the Interpol of one of the European countries. Alhamdulillah, when we meet, our job is to advise. With hikmah, without insulting, whenever I meet any heads of state, whether it be a chief minister, whether it be a prime minister, whether it be a president, and Allah has given the opportunity of us to meet several prime ministers and presidents of the world, mashallah. I'm nothing. When we meet, we give advice. Some of them change the full country. They, on the advice, they made me the religious advisor. They change the full country. Next year, America destroys them. You may know, you may not know their country. And he's no longer there as the president. No problem. At least the seat in Jannah is secured. They call that, I'm the godfather of that president. See, we have to keep on striving. Main thing is our we should stand secure our seat in Jannah. And that's what I'm doing. We are striving, we are struggling. And we only ask Allah that lay not on us a burden greater than we can bear. Put me in a test, where I will pass. If the test is difficult, no problem. But see to it that I can pass in the test. And Allah promises in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 2, uh, uh, 286. It's the last verse of the Quran that Allah does not lay on any person a burden greater than he can bear. <clears throat> and the more difficult the test is, the more higher is the reward. And I really would like to thank this country, Malaysia, and thank the majority of the Malaysians, mashallah, that for striving. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gets the Malaysian more closer to the Quran, more closer to Sunnah, so that all of us, inshallah, can meet in Jannah, inshallah, in Jannah the Hope that answers the question. Alhamdulillah. We continue with another question from the sister side on the station number three. Please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nazrah Muhammad Saleh. I'm a teacher from Tanah Merah. Uh, the verses are from, I think it's Al-Baqarah. Maybe you can uh, through with me. La ikrah hafidin. Please interpret uh, more about la ikrah hafidin. Wallahu alam. What the sister has quoted the verse of the Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter two, verse number two fifty six, which says la ikrah hafidin. But that's part of the verse, the complete verse, that there's no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. You know, many people say, like Rafidi, no compulsion in religion, therefore don't do dawah, don't preach Islam. That is not the meaning of like Rafidi. The complete verse says, like Rafidi, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. And if you grasp the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will take you from darkness to light. If you grasp the hand of the Satan, he will take you from light to darkness. That is the complete verse. That means... You cannot force anyone to accept Islam at the point of the gun or the point of the sword. It's haram in Islam. But that does not mean you should not do dawah. It does not mean you should not convey the message. So this verse says you cannot force anyone physically to accept Islam. Yes, you can do dawah. You can convince him. You can argue with him. You can debate with him. No problem. But you cannot force him physically to accept Islam. That is not allowed. Because... This should be with your choice. So this verse is a very powerful verse of the Quran coming after another very powerful verse of Ayat al-Kursi. Ayat al-Kursi, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 255, the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ayah of the throne. Then this verse starts with, like Rafidin, there's no compulsion in religion. So this verse is very important to understand that Islam is against forceful conversion. So people talk about, you know, Islam was spread by the sword. And I gave in my talk this verse that even if you had the sword, we cannot convert at the point of the sword because it is, not, it is prohibited in Islam. But at the same time, we have to convey the truth. The verse says, truth stands out clear from error. If you don't present the truth, 
how can you say truth stands out clear? That means this verse indicates that you have to present the truth and then let them make the choice. You cannot force them. It's very important for Dawa and for us to understand that Islam is against forceful conversion. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Another question, please, from the lady's side. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Honourable Doctor and Members of the Floor, my name is Wan Orihan Wan Hussein, Legal Officer from uh, Kota Baru Islamic City Municipal Council. I have one question. Uh, what is your opinion regarding the agnostic and atheism attacks young people Muslim in Malaysia? And what is the basic knowledge that the parents need to explore in order to overcome the problem? Thank you. Sister has the question that what is my view regarding an atheist and agnostic and what is the best way to overcome that problem? <clears throat> an agnostic is a person who does not comment about God. Neither does he say there is God, neither does he say there is no God. He doesn't say there is God, doesn't say no God, he's silent. The Buddhist actually is an agnostic religion, actually. Buddha was an agnostic. <clears throat> Why he was, that's the separate question. Atheist is a person who doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How you solve the problem? It's a big talk I gave in Kuala Lumpur, along with the question and answer session. It was for six hours. In 2016, I gave a talk, Is the Quran God's Word? Trying to prove about atheism. And that was the longest program of mine in the life. Started at about uh, 8.30, went up to about 3 o'clock in the morning. There were more than 50,000 people, mashallah. That was also in a stadium, Bukhijal Stadium. I'll just give a brief about it, and rest you can see the video cassette. Whenever I meet an atheist, the first thing I do is, I congratulate him. You may ask that, why am I congratulating an atheist? <clears throat> the reason I congratulate an atheist is, to the other people, most of the people, he's a Christian because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Most of the Muslims are Muslim because father is a Muslim. This atheist is thinking he may be having religious parents, but he may not agree. You know, he's saying that what the people who they call God, I don't agree. So the reason I congratulate an atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La Ilaha. Half my job is done. He's already said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La Ilaha. Only thing I have to do is Illa Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. So half the job is done to a person who is a mushrik, who is of a different religion. First I have to prove to him that God is worshipping is wrong. So if I meet a Christian, first I have to prove to him that Jesus Christ, peace be upon is not God. Correct? Half my time goes there. Here the atheist has already clean set. No God. La ilaha. Only thing I have to do is Allah, which is easy. So this person, he is not blindly following his parents. He says, I don't believe that this God who can be defeated, this God who can kill, who can be killed, this God who can die, I don't believe in such a God. So I say, even I don't believe in such a God. La ilaha. If this is what you're killing God who requires to eat, who requires to excrete, <laughs> who can be killed, who, who feels hungry, who is weak, I don't believe, la ilaha. Then I have to speak to him about the true God. If someone says Islam is a religion of terrorism, it's against science, against women, I don't believe in Islam. I said, even I don't believe in such a Islam. And then I correct to him, Islam is a scientific religion, it is the most logical religion, it has rights for the woman, blah, blah, blah. And then I convince him. So for the atheist, I tell him, the best definition of God is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute eternal. Lam yirid wa lam yulad, he begets not nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad, there's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given in the glorious Quran. Any person says that so-and-so candidate is worshipping his God, if that candidate fits in the four-line definition, we have no problem in accepting that person as God. So this surah class is the litmus test of theology. Theo means God, logic means study, study of God. Our beloved prophet said it is one third of the Quran. So once you explain the right concept of Allah, 
Inshallah, he will accept. There are various ways. There's other way called logical way. There's another way, scientific way. There are different ways of trying to prove to an atheist. All this you can find in my talk is the Quran, God's word, along with question and session for about six and a half hours. Inshallah, it will help you to get replies to most of the queries and how to speak to atheists and agnostic. Hope that answers the question. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the third round of the Q&A sessions. And I go again to the first station here. Please, gentlemen, your question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Noor Shakiman bin Muhammad. I'm an engineer by training. Honorable Dr. Zakir, my question is on dawah. I think you have spoken about dawah and a couple of questions about it already. But please forgive me. Uh, first and foremost, I appreciate what you and your group are doing or have done. And you just mentioned in your speeches or your speeches now that uh, Islam is the fastest growing religion in Europe or in UK, in USA, and Europe at large. But unfortunately, it is not happening in this region or in Asian region, for the reason known to most of us. Some even say that the reverse is happening. Is it anything to do with economic situation of the people in this region? Is it because the way we practice Islam is far from the real Islam? Is it because the akhlaq of some of the Muslims in the region are not attracting our non-Muslim brothers or sisters to Islam? Even though we have, or my questions have a lot of question marks, but essentially it's only one question. We love our non-Muslim brothers, we love our non-Muslim sisters, and we want them to be Muslims like us. And before that, before you answer, please accept my salam, or salam from my son, who is a new star in Sabah. Thank you. Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The brother asked a question that Islam is the fastest growing religion, and, and as I said, that it is the fastest growing religion in Europe, in America. But he's saying, unfortunately, in this part of the world, he's talking about Southeast Asia. In this part of the world, it is not the fastest growing, it is reverse. I'm sorry to say I disagree with you. I said Islam is the fastest religion throughout the world. The percentage there may be more, but even in Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, including Indonesia, including almost all the countries, Islam is the fastest going religion. Even in Malaysia, it is the fastest growing religion. I have given personal talks, and in my talks, you know, in that Bukit Jalil Stadium, about 21 people accepted Islam. One by one, uh, and group is separate, one by one. How many people ask me question out of the people that ask me question? 21 accepted Islam. So where you are saying it is not? I know so many reward centers. I have got so many students here. MashaAllah, I have got Dawa centers. And every day they are accepting Islam. So I don't know which statistics are you talking about. The percentage may differ here and there. That is the reason, you know, many people in Malaysia, they don't want me. Why? Because they don't want Islam to spread. Those who want me to stay, they want Islam to spread. You know, everyone doesn't want Islam to spread. So those who don't want Islam to spread, there may be some secular Muslims. There may be some uh, non-practicing Muslim. There may be a group of non-Muslim, but generally even the non-Muslim love me. In India, majority of the non-Muslim love me. It was the political influence non-Muslims for the World Bank, they maligned me. Otherwise, most of the Hindus, they love me. So because they wanted to break that, they created this you know, Islamophobia about terrorism, hate speech. And the judge in the tribunal court, Alhamdulillah, happened to be a Sikh. So when they went to attach my property, they attached the property. Then the higher court, we filed in the higher court. His name is Justice Manmohan. He said that I have seen the lectures of Dr. Zakir. Get me one sentence only. 
out of context from any of his speeches which promotes terrorism, I will attach all his properties. That the media doesn't say, maybe it came as short news, only few people saw. So which is more important, the allegation laid by the police is more important than the judgment given by judge is more important. Huh? The job of the police is not to give judgment, job of the police is to catch the right person, they catch the wrong person. Therefore I said, I have faith in the judiciary system, but not the prosecution system. Prosecution means they can keep you in jail for 20 years and the judge after 20 years says you are innocent. 20 years gone. So coming back to your question, in India, mashallah, it comes in Southeast Asia. Every day many people accepting Islam. Many people, alhamdulillah. Many. This doesn't go down the throat very well. Of mainly those people who are politically motivated. So here also, most of the people who don't want me the politically motivated, some are good politicians, most of them want me. Most of the politicians want me. Those who may not be in favor of Islam, who don't want Islam to spread, they don't want me. Those who want Islam to spread, they want me. So this is going, the, 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 the tussle between the good and evil is going to be there. It's part and parcel. It's part and parcel, mashallah. And, and never, mashallah, has anyone told me not to give speeches, whether it was the previous government, whether it was the present government, alhamdulillah. I am good with all the Muslims. My job is as a dai. And here, mashallah, Malaysia is a good scope. Mashallah. It is ingrained in the constitution of Malaysia, according to my study, that no non-Muslim can do dawah to the Muslim. It's not allowed by law. Mashallah. Very good. But a Muslim can do dawah. That is the constitution. That's the different thing the non-Muslim object to me. That's the different question. But by law, in Malaysia, according to the constitution, a Muslim can do dawa to anyone in Malaysia, Muslim and non-Muslim. But a non-Muslim cannot do dawa to a Muslim. Good constitution, because Islam is the only religion which is right, according to the Quran, in Surah Imran chapter 3, verse number 19. So Islam is spreading here. Yes, it should spread faster, that's a different question. That's a different question. How to do it, that's a different question. Whether you do it or not, Islam will prevail over the full world. What we have to do, we have to have more dawa centers, we have to have deal with more hikmah, have training centers, to speak with them with reason, with logic, with love. Now, once you start getting effective, your enemies will grow. The most effective person, the most popular person in the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The maximum enemy is anyone in the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Quran says, Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 24, verse number 30, for every prophet we appointed an enemy. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the last prophet. He has got an enemy. He has to have. So this is part and parcel of the Muslim. But do with hikmah. Do not break the rules of the Quran. Let them, let the other people be violent. At least. You should not be. We should continue. We want to show the mercy and the love of Islam. That's the reason we continue doing our work. I never normally get involved in the brick bats. You know. That will hamper my dawah work. Let them bark those who want to bark. We have to continue, be on the straight path, and do our work peacefully, convey the message. You know, most of the non-Muslims I met personally, they love me, you know. Uh, when I stayed in Putrajaya, I had gone to a medical clinic, I had a medical problem, and I saw a name of a Muslim on top. I went there and the person recognized me, oh, Dr. Zakir, and I thought that he was Muslim. And then I said, no, no, we won't take money from you. How can I take money from Dr. Zakir? He gave me his card, he turned out to be Hindu. In Malaysia. I go to a Chinese, he recognized me, oh, are you Dr. Zakir? I said, yes, oh, come, come, sit. No fees. So most of the non-Muslims in Malaysia are so very good like India. Those people who are making noise, all are politically motivated. All. The non-Muslims I meet, they're so good to me. They say, can I take a photograph with you? Now, why would they like to take a photograph with a terrorist? So what do you understand? This is, all those who are speaking, they're not following the law of the country. The Malaysian police says, I'm innocent. 
So they are more bothered about the Indian police which is fabricating. They are more Indian than Malaysian. <laughs> they are willing more than the Prime Minister of India. So what you have to do, you have to continue your dawah. And do it with hikmah. And inshallah, inshallah, we do it for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that we want all the human beings in the world, as many as we can. So that we get them on the straight path and make them closer to Allah and Israel. Hope that answers the question. Well, the gentleman in the red shirt, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Hilmi Abdullah. I'm a lawyer by profession and I'm also a state assemblyman for Gucci constituency. I, 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 will, I, I will recite two verses from Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Waqtuluhum haythu wajatumuhum. Uh, the meaning is uh, kill them. Waktuluhum, haythu wajatumuhum, wherever you find them. And, and another ayah is, Iza laqi tumul ladhina kafaru, if you meet the unbelievers, fadarbu riqab, strike their neck until. And this two ayah, if uh, read by the non Muslim, they, they will be frightened. Uh, they will uh, worry about Islam, Muslim. And uh, in Malaysia, we got 30% population among non-Muslim. And our situation now, we also got a minister from non-Muslim. And uh, they are, they are, our enemy always, uh, uh, what we call, uh, repeating the the what we call uh, repeating uh, negative ayah from Quran to threaten the non-Muslim from supporting the Islamic party uh, and I need your suggestion or advice how we as Muslim to to face our dilemma because we, we have 30 percent population for the non-Muslim and one more question chairman first I'll answer this question then you can answer okay. we already have two questions before I answer your question, you repeated twice that the population of non-Muslims is 30%. I don't know where you get a statistic from your uh, member of state assembly. According to the statistics I read, it is 27%. Muslims are 63%. Exactly. Malay, the pure Malay are 51, 52%. With all the other Muslim, Indian Muslim, and other Yemeni Muslim, all Muslim put together, it goes to 62 to 63%. You know, it makes a difference. You are giving them 10% more. So the brother will say that you are right. You know, you're increasing their population. <laughs> but Alhamdulillah, but as you know, that the most original Malay, the Bhumi Putra, most of them were Muslims. All the others came afterwards. The original are Muslim. They came later on. Britishers got them. They came from China. They came from India, etc. Now coming to your question. The verse that you quoted that wherever you find them, you kill them. And the second one that you strike them. The first verse you quoted is from Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5. That wherever you find the kafir, you kill him. You tell him, in Malaysia, number 1, how many, how many Muslims have killed the kafir here in Malaysia in all these years? Only because of this verse? Zero. Zero. The killings in Malaysia are done more by non-Muslims. If you go to the Home Ministry Department, I don't want to give the statistics here. There are only 15% of the Muslims are, are registered criminals. According to the Home Ministry Department, two years back. Today I'll have to refresh it. 15% of the criminals are registered in the Home Ministry Department, if you go to the website. And 15, majority 85% are non-Muslim. 45% Hindus, Chinese about 30%. Who says that? Not me. Home Ministry Department. And you are a legislature, so you should be able to speak in the council. You should do your homework. So there's more killing and criminal activities done in Malaysia by whom? According to the Home Ministry Department, by whom? If this verse was true, this 27% non-Muslim would not have lived in Malaysia, correct? Right or wrong? That means no one is implementing that verse as they think. 
The right reply to this is you have to read the full verse in context. This verse of the Quran of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, you have to read the context. For the context, you, you read from the starting of the surah. It speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims of Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. This peace treaty was broken unilaterally by the Mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, he is giving a warning. He says to the Mushriks, put things straight in four months time, otherwise a declaration of war. They break the treaty. Now Allah is giving them a warning. To put things straight in four months time, otherwise a declaration of war. Then, verse number 5 speaks in Surah Tawbah. In the battlefield Allah is talking about. Wherever you find the enemies, kill them. Wait for them in every stratagem of war. Let them hear the word. But after verse number 5, they jump to verse number 7. You know why? Verse number 6 has the reply to the query. Verse number 6 says that if the mushriks, if the kafir want asylum, don't just give it to them. Escort them to a place of security so that they hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here Quran is talking in a battlefield. In a battlefield, the army general, what will he say? When the enemies come, you run away. What will the army general say? In the battlefield, he will tell you, kill them. So this verse is revealed in a battlefield when the enemies break the treaty and when they come for the war. In the battlefield, wait for them in every stratagem of war and kill them wherever you find them. What is wrong in that? If Malaysia goes for war and if the enemies come, what will the army general of Malaysia say? When the enemies come, run away, he will say. But what the Quran says in the next verse of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 6, is phenomenal. No army general will say that. The maximum the army general will say, okay, if the enemies won't let them run away. Here, Quran says, escort them to a place of security. That means if they want peace, if they want asylum, don't just let them go. Escort them so that they are secure. Now they are under your protection. This is Islam. Almost all the verses, even that verse, you could, I think it's from Anfal or whichever verse it says. Most of the verses in the Quran which talk about Kital, the next verse says, peace is better. Even the other verse, peace is better. So all these verses are in the battlefield. Now in the battlefield, you have to boost the morale of the soldiers. So what is wrong? They are quoting out of context. If this was a normal time, then the non-Muslim would not live in the Muslim majority country. You know, India, we ruled, India ruled, Muslims ruled India for about a thousand years. No non-Muslim would have been alive. This verse doesn't mean that. It's talking about when the kafir, non-Muslim, when they break the treaty and come to you for war, in the battlefield you have to attack them, you have to kill them. This is normal. Hope that answers the question, brother. Okay, I'd like to welcome once again Yamba Hormat. He's the Kelantan Assembly Assemblyman who would like to pose another question. No, no. Okay, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Ya Muhammad. Ya Muhammad, silakan. Thank you, sir. As Islamic party, our, one of our mission is to impose Islamic law in our country. From your personal opinion, uh, is it possible for us to impose Islamic law now? If, if the answer is negative, where is, when, when is uh, pro exact time, proper time to enforce Islamic law for our country? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question that he's asking, coming from the Islamic party, that should we implement the Islamic law in the country? As per as the Quran, Islamic law should not be imp imposed in the country, should be imposed in the full world, inshallah. We are vice president of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, full world, why only Malaysia? We can do or not do is secondary. For Allah is the creator. As far as can we implement the Sharia here? Always you should understand that there is a procedure. There is a procedure which should be done. And anyone who has the basic knowledge of the Quran, basic, not in depth, if he's a practicing Muslim, he has to agree that Sharia is the best law. And here you are majority Muslim. So if 
The problem that may come here is implementing Sharia is the politics. If you keep politics aside, then implementing is possible. If you bring in politics, it's difficult. Because according to me, today's politics in most part of the world, not everywhere, but most part, it takes you away from Quran Sunnah. Today's politics. The politics as was there at the time of the Khulfa Rashidin. If you see a Khalifa, mashallah, Tumar how he used to sleep on the floor, <clears throat> being the Khalifa of the Mominin, Amirul Mominin, how he used to implement, how he used to check anyone becomes the governor. He used to say, anyone becomes the governor. Before you govern, I will check your wealth. After you become governor, if your wealth is in excess, you give it to Baitul Mal. To his close relatives. To Khalid bin Walid, Radilawan, Khalid bin Walid, the sword of Allah. When he made him governor, and after he finished, he had excessive wealth. He did business. He didn't tell him that you lied. He didn't doubt his honesty. Not that he took bribe, which today most politicians in the world take. But he said that if you want to become my governor, you have to lead the worldly affairs. He made in proper business. He said, no, you can only have so much excess in so many years. Balance, Baitul Mal. He was shocked. He felt so bad that when he heard that the close relative of Hazrat Umar, to him also he did the same, then he said, okay, this is his style of justice. Today, your bank balance may not show, but your balance of your relatives and friends go up. So what you have to understand that if you want to implement Islam or Sharia, first you have to agree that we belong to one party, Allah's party. Not by name, it is by deed. And all the Muslims should unite together. We should put our party differences aside. And if all Muslims unite together, putting our party differences alive, it's possible. If we don't unite, it's not possible. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, وَاتَسِيمُ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمْيَ وَلَا تَفْرَقُ Hold fast to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. And whenever I meet, whether politicians abroad, whether politicians in Malaysia, most of the parties, I tell them, let's come close to the Quran. And only way you can unite the Muslims of the Ummah, Muslims of this country, Muslims of the state, is on the basis of Quran. So we have to keep our differences aside. And for the bigger cause of the Muslim Ummah, if you unite, we'll be a stronger force, you may lose your seat. I mean, seat of position, no problem. You may get a seat in Jannah. The problem if you unite, then who will be the leader is the question. <laughs> so if you lose your seat in this world and secure a seat in Jannah, it's a very good bargain, deal. Correct? So the problem is if you unite, there can be only one leader. So the other leader should agree that we give up our position so that we get a position in Jannah. So if you have that faith, that we are doing for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we unite and we don't bother about this seat but bother about the seat in Jannah it will be a very good bargain whether it's successful here or not Akhira you're successful so because today we find in the Muslim Ummah not that the leaders don't know they are knowledgeable they are intelligent most of the Muslim country leaders not that they are fools but They have less faith in Allah, less faith in the Quran. So if you have faith in Allah and the Quran, one more thing. If you want to implement in a place where there are non-Muslims available, it's important that you explain to them the maqasid sharia Let me give you one example. Like suppose you say that you want to implement Sharia in Klantan. Okay, Klantan, 96.2% are Muslims will be easy. But you want to in Malaysia, there are 28, 27% non-Muslims. Correct? So if you say that you want to implement the Sharia, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, as to the thief, be it a man or woman, chop off his hands. Chopping off the hands? Today in this age of science and technology, non-Muslims say it's a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless religion. But we have to explain to them the maqasid the Sharia. 
The reason the chopping of the hands is they as a deterrent. And most of the non-Muslim think that if you go to Saudi Arabia where this law is practiced, every second person you come across will have his hand chopped off. It's not so. I've been to Saudi Arabia maybe 50 to 100 times. I've not met a single person with his hand chopped off. It may be taking place, but it's not as common as you feel. What you have to make you understand the makasas of Sharia is that there are more than 80 conditions to be fulfilled before you cut the hands. For example, if a million ringgit is kept on the stage and someone carries it with him, will his hand be chopped off? The answer is no. Million ringgit? No. Why? I'll tell you later on. Suppose someone robs bread, will his hand be chopped off? The answer is no. Who will be held responsible? Who is governing this state, this country? How can someone steal bread? It is the duty of the Khalifa of the state to see to it that everyone is fed. So if a person robs bread, who is res held responsible? Who? Not the robber, the Khalifa. This is Islam. You can't chop over his hand. There are various conditions. If you keep one million ringgit, somebody robs. Who is responsible? Why did you keep it in the open? For cutting of the hands, that thing should be in lock and key. There are rules. 80 conditions, more than 80 conditions required. And if anyone is not fulfilled, you cannot chop that. You can give some other punishment. This is Islam. So makasid sharia is as a deterrent. The Islamic sharia says, if someone commits adultery, what is the, what is the punishment? Hath penalty? Put to throw into death. Correct? I want to ask you, how many people at the time of the Prophet were stoned to death? For that you require four witnesses, correct? There is not a single case in the life history of the Prophet, except for a woman who volunteers herself. That I did zina, Prophet said go away. She comes back, I did zina, Prophet said go away. I did zina, okay, when the child comes, come back. After that, regularly when she pesters the Prophet, then the Prophet gives the penalty. And when people say and start cursing her, the Prophet says, her repentance, if it's distributed in Medina, would forgive all the people of Medina. I want to know in Saudi Arabia, how many people were killed because of adultery? I have met many of the judges. The makasas of Sharia is that maybe a non-Muslim who's caught adultery and is brought to the court of law. The judge says, really adultery? He says, yes. The judge says, okay, lunchtime. Then the lawyer goes and tells, say you didn't do. Why? If you say you did, you'll be punished. If you say don't do, you'll get less punishment. So makasid the sharia is as a deterrent. Why did Allah say that four witnesses? That means they're doing in public. That means they're doing in public and spoiling the society. If you see in the history, if you see the history of the Ummah, Abbas said, hardly four or five people may have been put to death in 100 years, 200 years. So people pick up this and portray Islam to be a religion of terror, of ruthlessness. No. I am asking you the question. In Islam, first it is you have to pay zakat. Every rich person who has a saving of more than 2.5%, who has a saving of more than nisab level, should give 2.5% of his wealth in charity. Every year, correct? After that, if someone robs, then chopping of the hands, after following all this, makase the sharia, I'm asking the question today, do you know the country which has the maximum rate of crime where? In USA. I'm asking you the question, if you implement this law in USA, every rich person who has a saving of more than Nisab level should give 2.5% in charity every lunar year. After that, if anyone robs, you chop off the hand, will the rate of robbery, theft and crime in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Decrease. It's a practical law. That's the reason the least rate of crime anywhere in the world, Saudi Arabia. Not that the police is very intelligent. Not that they are very smart. Because they implement the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it acts more as a deterrent. There is a makasid sharia. So, if you explain this to your non-Muslim, that why does Islam do this more as a deterrent? Ah! If they have all the IT proof, my hand will be chopped off. So surely he will not rob. In most of the other law, okay, you are caught. You can bribe someone, 
You go to jail, you come out after two months, after three months, no problem. When you are robbing two, three million ringgit and you are in jail for two, three months, no problem. But if you the two, three million ringgit chopping off that, he will not agree. The makas is the sharia. So this, if you have to implement, you have to educate the citizens of Malaysia. That the most practical law in the world. See where it is more practical. About hijab. About death penalty for a rapist. The maximum number of rape is in USA. Implement every woman should wear hijab. Man looks at a woman should lower his gaze. After that someone rapes death penalty. Will the rate of rape increase, decrease or will it remain the same? It will decrease. So for that you will have to talk. You will have to get people who know how to convey the message to non-Muslims. And then, inshallah, it will be possible. But first, you have to unite the Muslim. Without that, not possible. If you unite the Muslim, then if you, if you have the full majority on your side, and then explain to the non-Muslims, do you know, I do my research before settling in the city, the city which has the maximum number of crime in Southeast Asia, which city? Which city? Which Dubai? Kuala Lumpur and Karachi, both of them compete. Karachi, we have heard. I was shocked. I was shocked that Kuala Lumpur is always number one or number two among the Southeast Asian cities. Maximum crime. What is the solution? Out of ten cities, which maximum number of crime, four are in Malaysia. Penang, high rate. Where there is wealth, you'll find the thieves also. What is the solution? Maybe petty crime, whatever it is. What you have to understand, you have to make the people understand about the makase, the sharia. And then, if you talk about sharia, it will be acceptable. Otherwise, it will look more like a religion of terror, look like a religion of violence. So every, re every law in Islam has a logical reason for it. If you can explain that, people will love it and people will expect it. People accept it, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are about uh, five minutes to 12.45. And I was ordered by the uh, organizer to make a stop for this session at 12.45. So may I go for the next last question from the lady's side, please? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Nignor Najiha. From, uh, I'm an internship student from Corporate Management Department. So my question is, um, what is your opinion from Islamic perspective about those who got employed from middlemen and they are not qualified for that job? So this kind of situation is basically suppressed of those people who more qualify and need that job. So, doctor, I need your opinion about that. Thank you. If I understand the question correctly, that a person gets a job who's not qualified due to a middleman. So is it correct? And people who are qualified don't get the job. Sister, first you have to understand that how did the middleman give him the job? If it's because of bribing, it's not accepted. It's haram. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188, that do not use your wealth as a bait for the judges in order to eat other people's wealth. It's haram. Maybe the middleman felt, okay, this person qualified, okay, he gets 80 marks, he gets 60 marks, but the 60 person marks has a more requirement of a job, he may be more poor, and if he does that as a favor, depending upon the reason, you can't give a blanket rule. There are options where the person in authority can go up and down without breaking the rules of Sharia. Taking bribe is haram. If you give it because he's a relative, no. If he maybe is helping, okay, this person requires the job much more. If I don't give a job, his family will die. He has got 10 people in his family. There may be X, Y, Z reason. So you cannot give a blanket rule that, okay, fine, a middleman comes. So who is that middleman is important? Why did he do important? You have to make everything clear. If it by bribing, it is haram. If it is breaking any rule of the Sharia, it's haram. But if you don't break the rule, like many a times people come to us for a job and we don't have vacancy. We give him, okay, fine, work. And he's sitting full day doing nothing. What are we doing? We are helping, doing charity. Another person comes, okay, why didn't I get a job? Are, Baba, I gave charity to him. 
Instead of giving money, he's sitting and doing nothing. You don't require help, but you're keeping him. So you cannot come and tell me, oh, why didn't you take me? So the thing that who is in a position, he has a right to say yes or no. Like if you have an examination rule that so much percentage will get, if it's public, then they have to follow that rule. Then there are some trustees who can overrule. There are rules and regulations for everything. As long as they're not breaking the rule, as long as they're not breaking the Sharia, it's accepted. If you're breaking the rule of the Sharia and following the rule of the trust, the Sharia is more important. So if you break any rule of the Sharia, it is haram. If the Sharia permits you, and if that organization also permits you, it's permissible. Everything is not black and white. You have to understand the full reason and logic and then give the judgment. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zaki Knight. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the program.